praise the Lord. You know, this week as I was walking and praying, I heard the Lord remind me that we really need to strengthen the body right now. And part of that strengthening process is being reminded that our God is a God of power. We do not have a weak God. We have a powerful, mighty God. And we desperately need that power right now. The second part of that process is remembering that God is also a God of covenant. He is a God who honors marriage covenants. He is a God who honors salvation covenants. He's a God who honors adoption covenants. And he is also a God who honors the future covenant that he has made with his people. He promises and he keeps his promises. But still another part of that strengthening process is what I want to touch on specifically today. You see, in our country, in our Western world today, we have division. Whether it's north and south, whether it's black and white, whether it is uh, Hispanic and English, whether it is Asian and white, whether it is Ukraine and Russia, we have division. We have disunity. And we have denominationalism. Now, what do I mean by that? How many of you know that Christians struggle to work together well? Okay. I, when I first got saved, it was in a Presbyterian church. And I can remember that uh, we had Billy Graham, a Billy Graham crusade that was coming to the city of Calgary where I was living. And I was excited because, I mean, everybody knew Billy Graham's name. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. We have a chance to participate. And our pastor got up and he said, we will not participate in the Billy Graham crusade. And I went, what? Well, why not? He said, because they're inviting Catholics to be a part of this. And I, I'm waiting for the explanation. Okay, why can't we work with them if the Catholics are there? And he never did explain that. Now, I found out the theological ramifications and reasons why later, but basically it came down to <laughs> how silly. Why can we not work together? Why can we not learn how to march together? We're called to fight as one, but we can't even march together. Did you know that there are more than 380,000 churches in the United States? Did you know that more than 150,000 of those churches are independent and non-denominational churches that have no affiliation with anyone else? Did you know that there are more than 700 denominations in the world that are called Pentecostal? Now, you thought I was going to say 700 church denominations. No, no, no. There are more than 45,000 church denominations in our world today. We really struggle to work together. <laughs> There's an old joke about the fact that Baptists are really good at two things, eating and splitting. But the fact is, is that fits for Christians, period. We'll show up to a potluck, and then we'll split over whether the dessert is any good or not. Rather than working out our differences biblically, we split off and we do our own thing. And God must weep as we divide again and again and again, and the enemy must just find this hilarious. Pentecostals don't work well with oneness Pentecostals. Presbyterians don't work well with Lutherans. Baptists don't work well with Mennonites. Christian Missionary Alliance doesn't work well with Catholics. And the list goes on and on and on. And the enemy must be thrilled because it makes it so much easier to further divide and destroy. In fact, our situation is very similar to a historical situation that Israel went through. 500 years before Jesus, in 586 BC, Jerusalem was attacked and conquered by the Babylonian army. The sad part of that historical fact, they knew it was coming years before it actually happened. In Isaiah 39, verses 5 to 7, almost 150 years before Jerusalem fell, the prophet Isaiah said this to the king of the country, Hezekiah. He said, hear the word of the Lord Almighty. 
The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood who will be born to you will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. This word was spoken well in advance of the tragedy that happened. Do you know what Hezekiah's response was? In his heart, he said, whew, at least it won't happen in my day. Ah! Tell me something. How many of you are grandparents? How many of you want to hand a worthless, useless, garbage world off to your grandkids? But that's what Hezekiah did. Rather than go to prayer and say, oh God, is there anything we can do? They did nothing. And they condemned their grandchildren to servitude. The Jews knew it was coming. And rather than change, they continued to taunt God and tempt him to bring down wrath instead of blessing. In fact, the prophet Ezekiel summarized the condition of the Jewish hearts in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, when the Lord said this, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. I am so grateful that Carolina is up here praying. I am so grateful for the folks that come out on Saturday night to prayer meeting. I am so grateful for the folks that come in here Sunday morning before service and are in the sanctuary praying. Because I know that they are tearing down strongholds. I know they are standing in the gap for this congregation. I know that they are fighting on their knees for the future of Watertown. You see, folks, God did not want to exile Israel. He wanted them to repent so that he could continue to bless them. Do you, do you understand that God's heart longs to bless his people? Cindy, he doesn't sit up in heaven going, oh, great, Cindy wants another blessing. <laughs> he doesn't sit up there and go, Clint, you asked a month ago for a blessing. You've come up with your quota there, man. He doesn't do that. Do you understand that, that God wants to bless his people? Do you understand that he repeatedly warned the people to repent so that he would not have to punish them? Do you understand that they refused to listen and they brought judgment on themselves? Do you understand that we have to learn from their mistakes? Today, there are holes in our walls. Today, there are people proclaiming, all will be well, in spite of the fact that the enemy is standing just outside our walls, seeking to s kill and steal and destroy, and looking for someone to devour. And today, God is still looking for someone among them who will build up the wall and stand in the gap on behalf of the land. And today, I want to take us to the book of Nehemiah, because we need to learn how to protect our city. Now, what do I mean by our city? Do I mean Watertown? Yes. Do I mean this church? Yes. Do I mean the state? Yeah. Do I mean the USA? Yes, I do. I believe that we are called as spirit-filled soldiers of God to do more than just protect this small brick bunker. And it is a brick bunker, by the way. Come in here on a day where it's like 95, you won't be hot. I go home... First thing I do when I get back to the house, I told this to Leslie the other day, I walk into the house at lunch and I'm like, I'm going outside to sit in the sunshine. I need to bake. And Micah comes over and she goes, you're cold. Yeah, I'm cold. I work in an ice house all day long. I believe that we are called to do more than just protect this. We are called to fight for our town and our state and our country. In fact, we are called to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Watertown is our Jerusalem. South Dakota is our Judea. America is our Judea and Samaria, and then the world lies beyond that. Our walls 
are broken down. Our cities are at risk. The enemy has access to what we treasure the most. The forces of darkness have access to our loved ones. And you and I are the ones called to stand in the gap and not let him in. We need to get our defenses up and in place so that we can focus on rebuilding the infrastructure. How many of you are grateful that they're doing some paving work in the city right now? I am, in spite of the fact that they keep putting up like road closed and then people are like, oh look, slalom course. They just go around the signs. It's really rather fun to watch. We have got infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt because it's broken down. But that's the same in the Christian faith. We need to do this, but how do we do it? And this is where Nehemiah has answers. So allow me to give you a little bit of background so you can follow where the Spirit is leading us today. I know this is a lot of history today, but you know what? We learn from history. After the fall of Jerusalem, the Babylonians took the very best and the brightest to Babylon, and the Jewish exiles were there for 70 years. An entire generation was born there. Partway through that 70-year period, the Persians defeated the Babylonians, but Babylon remained the capital city. In about 550 BC, during the Persian king Cyrus's reign, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem. In fact, he let them go back and he paid for their temple to be rebuilt under Ezra the priest. Can you imagine that? Well, actually, I guess we can because what does, the, what does America do every time they go in and have a conflict? They, they, they rebuild that area. Bigger and better. That's what Cyrus was doing. Oh, you guys want to go back? Fine. You don't have a temple? Here, let me pay for it. History says that the new temple paid for from the king's treasury cost the equivalent of $1 billion today. Yeah. The last of the Persian kings that we are concerned with was the king named Artaxerxes because he had a cupbearer named Nehemiah. Now, cupbearer in that day was kind of like the head counselor in that time. No one was more trusted than the cupbearer. No one else had the king's ear like Nehemiah did. What does the cupbearer do? The cupbearer brings the wine to the king and he taste tests it first so that if there's any poison in the cup, <laughs> not the king. It's kind of a dead end job. Sorry, bad joke. <laughs> So the book of Nehemiah picks up the story of the exiles about 80 years after the book of Ezra. Nehemiah is a book written about historical facts, but it contains incredible spiritual parallels to where we are today. There are four steps that you need to take to protect your city, and they are all found in the book of Nehemiah. So first off, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Father, this morning, as we dig into the book of Nehemiah, Teach us how to protect our city. Teach us how to be those who stand in the gap. Teach us how to be on guard for thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah knew that Cyrus had rebuilt the temple. So years later, when his brother shows up, Nehemiah was expecting to hear a glowing report of life in Jerusalem. Yeah, everything's great, Nehemiah. We're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're building this, and we're building that. Instead, his brother tells him that the city is in ruins and open to attack from roving bands of raiders, thieves, and even wild animals. This is a picture of what one of those houses would have looked like following the destruction of Jerusalem. This is just an ancient house of the style that they would have built. Okay, Animals downstairs, I don't mean the kids, and, and everybody else lives upstairs. Okay. From the report that we get in Nehemiah chapter 1, we discover our first step about protecting your city. Recognize the threat. 
you don't, if you're not looking, you're not going to see it. And if you don't recognize it, you're not going to deal with it. And after this, we see Nehemiah's response to the news that his brother has brought. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 7, it says this, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant to love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you this day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly against you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Do you hear how he reacted to the news? Do you, do you hear what he says? Nehemiah hears the news about the state of the city, its disgraceful condition, and its vulnerability, and his heart breaks. Hear me. Nehemiah had been born in Babylon. He had lived his whole life in captivity. He had never seen Jerusalem, and yet his heart longed for the city of his people and his God. How many of you have ever driven around Watertown and gone, oh, I never noticed that before. Oh, I never noticed that before. Way too often, as we live in a city, we get blind to the city. We need to be praying for open eyes that we would see that this is more than a cluster of houses and businesses. It is people. It is said that years ago, D.L. Moody was approached by three other ministers wanting to know why he was so successful in reaching the lost. D.L. Moody asked them to go up to the top floor of a building and when they got up there, he asked them to look out a window. The first minister was looking out and D.L. Moody said, what do you see? The minister said, oh, I see houses and buildings and stores and carriages and people. And Moody said to the second guy, what do you see? And he said, I see men and women who are going off to work and children that are playing in the street. And he turned to the third guy and he said, what do you see? And he said, I see trees and animals and people. And, and he turned in frustration and he said, what do you see, Mr. Mo Mr. Moody? And then all three of them noticed that D.L. Moody was standing there with tears running down his face into his beard. He said, I see souls that are going to hell without Jesus Christ. If we don't open our eyes to the spiritual reality of those around us, all we will see are the houses. But these are all temporary buildings. The eternal buildings live inside of those houses. And we need to have hearts that cry for them. Nehemiah steps into the gap. His heart breaks. He lumps himself in with the people that have sinned, and then he stands in repentance for them. And does he stop there? No, he doesn't. In Nehemiah chapter 2, we see that this man goes before the king, and when, the, when he does, the king goes, what do you want? Nehemiah in verse 5 of chapter 2 says, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Nehemiah doesn't just step into the gap to pray. He steps into work. There is the second step to protect your city. Accept your responsibility. I'm an immigrant in this city. But so help me God, it is my city. I will fight for it. I will stand in the gap. I will pray for it. Now, if I have to defend it, so help me God, I will. We have to accept our responsibility because that's actually commanded in Scripture. I have placed you in Babylon. Now pray for the good of that city. That's what God told them to do. That's what God tells us to do. And with that, Nehemiah heads off to Jerusalem. He has his purpose, he has his commission, and now he needs to move ahead. So in the latter part of chapter 2, he arrives in the city, and 
chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, we read this. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. And I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. What does he do? He scopes out the report that his brother brought him. In investigative terms, it's put this way. Trust but verify. Nehemiah trusted his brother's report, but he checked it out for himself. He wanted first-hand information about the actual condition of the city's walls, so he heads out with a few others, but he didn't tell anyone what he was doing. No one knew that he was in the city. No one knew what he had in mind. No one had an inkling that he was forging a plan. Why? Why didn't they guess? Why didn't he tell them? Well, let me ask you this. How many of you would go to a plumber to have your engine fixed in your car. <laughs> this man was a cup bearer. He was not a mason. He was not a brick builder. He was not a construction expert. He was a cup bearer. He was a soft-handed politician who worked with his head, not his hands. Nehemiah had probably never picked up a hammer or a trowel in his life. He was the most unlikely architect in history. He knew his fine wines, not his borders. He knew his grapes, not his grout. He knew how to lay it on thick, but not how to lay a brick. And yet he had one quality that God is always looking for. He was willing. He does a full circuit of the city and he comes back with an understanding of the severity of the problem. And the next morning he calls the elders together. He opens their eyes to the need. And how do the people respond? Well, in, in verse 18 of chapter 2 it says this. They heard Nehemiah and they respond with, let's start rebuilding. So here's the third step. Identify the problem. The first three steps are preparatory. They allow you to start the work that is needed to protect your city. Now we get to step four, and this is where the actual work starts. Now, we Christians are not bad at steps one through three. We're okay at recognizing the threat. We're, we're so, so at accepting our responsibility. We're mediocre at identifying the problem. But when it comes to step four, we are really bad. Why? Well, the action... The, the answer is actually extremely simple. We're lazy. It's true. We're lazy. I watched a testimony while I was away of a man who grew up in a satanic home. He prayed five hours a day against the Christians. Five hours a day. The Muslims get together and pray five times a day. Witches and warlocks, they pray for multiple hours a day against us. And the average amount of prayer that Christians put up, five minutes a week. Wow. We are lazy. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 with me. We love these verses in church. They are quoted so many times, we probably know them by heart. Cherie. Paul says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Who does the work? God does the work. And with that, we stop. We want God to do all the work. We don't want to do the laboring because we're afraid of of slipping into salvation by works mentality. We don't want to get into a legalistic mind frame. So instead, we do nothing. But listen to what Paul says in the very next verse. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hear me today. Spirit of laziness in Jesus' name, get out. We are not saved by works, but we are supposed to do works after we're saved. You are called to work. 
You are called to build. Now, I'm going to say something this morning that is probably not going to go over very well, but that's okay. I'm still going to say it. There was no retirement plan in Scripture. There is no widower list in Scripture. If you want a handout from the church, hear me today. Biblically, you have to be over 60, you have to be a widow, and you have to have no family. That was the condition. Yeah, but what if I'm a guy? Get a job. What if I can't? Get a job anyway. That was the biblical mandate. That's what is expected. Now, I know that sounds harsh. Because we live in a day and age where we have all sorts of social security nets. But the reality is, it's not the church's job to pay for you. Your job is to get out and work. We have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you're not doing them, you are in disobedience. We are not saved by works, but we are supposed to work after we are saved. Nehemiah calls the people. He commissions them to look after the sections of the wall near their home. Why? Well, you know, how many of you mow your own lawn? I know, Jerry, and you mow mine too. I, I saw that hand shoot up real quick. But the fact is, is that we look after our own yards, don't we? We plant our own flowers. We shovel our own snow. We water our own lawns. And Nehemiah smartly goes, hey, you know what? You know what, Micah, if this wall is falling down behind your house, you're the perfect one to rebuild it because it's protecting what you value most. Don't go and rebuild over Colton's house because you might cut corners and go, <laughs> you'll never know. But you're going to want it good and strong behind your house. Nehemiah called each family to look after their own section of the wall. He reminded them in Nehemiah 4.14, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families. Fight for your sons and your daughters. Fight for your wives and your homes. And there Nehemiah reveals step four. Make this personal. Gloria, the enemy is after your family. Make it personal. Pray for them. Wayne, the enemy is after your family. Don't rely on Gloria's prayers. You do it. Fight for your family. And that's the way we protect our home. That's the way we protect our family. That's the way we protect our city. When we make this personal and we go, no, this is my city. Years ago, when I first got into ministry, I was out in a town of 300 town's name was Huendon. We had these uh, individuals from, an, from, a, from a cult that came around, and they were going door to door in, in my town. And they knocked on my door. So I opened the door, and I had a discussion with them. And they were getting heated and rather rude, and so I finally said, listen, I will be very honest with you. This is my town. I'm the shepherd in this town. If you want to lie to people, I will follow you door to door and I will renounce you for the liars that you are. And they looked at me and went, oh, you don't have the, and they used a, a term that I won't repeat in church. And they walked off. So I followed them. They went to my neighbors. They rang on the doorbell. The door opened. I went, morning, Violet. How are you? She's like, Sean, what's going on? I said, well, these folks want to talk to you about what they think. And I'm here to just tell you that they're wrong. And Violet looked at these folks and they said, I know him, I don't know you, go away. So they went to the next house. I went to the next house. And then we went to the next house. And the next house. And the next house. And we got about ten houses down and the folks opened the door and they went, I've already gotten a phone call from Violet about this. Go away! They turned and they looked at me and they said, are you going to follow us all the way around town? I said, yes, I told you, this is my town. Make it personal. These are your people. 
This is your church. This is your city. This is your home. Fight for it. And how do you do that? Well, we sing a song that says, this is how I fight my battles. Do it in worship. Do it in praise. Do it in prayer. But do it. Four steps. Hear me today. There are incredible spiritual parallels in Nehemiah that are applicable for us. Recognize the threat. The people had lived for decades with a beautiful temple and ruined walls. Today, people live with a changed heart and a ruined life. Understand today that you are not created for crap life. You are created for abundant life, not a ruined life. You are not meant to fall down every time the enemy blows in your direction. If the enemy can throw you down for a loop day in and day out, then you have holes in your walls. Stop thinking that this is the way the Christian life is supposed to be and recognize the threat. You are called for more than this. Accept your responsibility. The holes in your defenses are your responsibility to fix. Scripture says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It does not say, Nyla, work out your husband's faith with fear and trembling. It does not say, Scott, work out Rod's salvation with fear and trembling. It says, work out your own. Because the garbage that you are letting in hurts you and it hurts others. A city with a broken wall put everyone at risk. If you go outside and smoke up a storm, then everyone around you gets inundated by the smell. You're not hurting anyone else, but you are stinking everyone else out. Christians who have themselves as their focus hurt everyone around them. And I'm not saying that smoking is necessarily a sin. I'm using it as an illustration of how it impacts everybody. We had a wedding in here yesterday, and somebody was outside smoking marijuana. You could smell it in the basement hours afterwards. It's just the way it is, folks. It impacts everybody. If you burn your hand, the whole body feels the pain. If you're letting sin into your life or opening the door for the enemy, the whole body is at risk. Identify the problem. Every spiritual attack that comes can be filtered down to five things. And guess where they can all be found? They can all be found in Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, it says this. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. All five areas of attack are in that small section. You ready to hear them? The enemy will attack your personhood. Those feeble Jews. The enemy will attack your motives. Will they restore their wall? The enemy will attack your relationship with God. Will they offer sacrifices? The enemy will attack your ability. Will they finish in a day? Can they really bring the stones back to life? And the enemy will attack your quality of life and ministry. Even a fox climbing on it would break down that wall of stones. What area are you being attacked in? Then start building the wall in that area. Grab onto the word of God and start using the promises and truths in it to fortify your defenses against the enemy's lies. Make it personal. God rebuilds a temple, but we are called to rebuild the walls. That's why there's weakness in the church today. God comes into our hearts and rebuilds the temple, and then we sit and sigh while the walls of our lives, our families, our cities, and our nations remain in ruins. Stop waiting for God to do it and get to work. Paul even says in Philippians 2.12, continue to work out your salvation. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Your, en your eternity is at stake. Your marriage is at stake. Your kids are at stake. Your family, your job, your future, your hope, your joy, your tomorrow, your peace. All of these things and more are at stake because the enemy is looking for someone to devour. The enemy is going to look for someone to steal, to kill and destroy. It doesn't get any more personal than this. We need to strengthen each other. We need to protect each other. We need to encourage each other. 
In Nehemiah, there's a very interesting word play that happens. The words to encourage and the words to hold spears are the same Hebrew words. In other words, you encourage your brothers and sisters by being willing to fight for them. But Sean, I feel like I'm stuck in the wilderness right now. That's okay. I want you to understand something as I close today. If you feel like you're in the wilderness right now, God wants you in the wilderness right now. And Satan wants you in the wilderness right now. But even though they both want you there, they have a very different purpose. Satan wants you in the wilderness to destroy you. God wants you in the wilderness to destroy the works of the devil. This is a war. We are under attack. But if we leave the walls broken, it will go from being a battle to being a slaughter. I will not let the enemy kill my sheep without a fight. The people around you are your support and your ministry. Encourage each other. Hold one another accountable. Lift each other up. Hold each other up to the standard of Jesus. For decades, the walls lay in ruins. And then under Nehemiah, they were built again in 52 days. I want to show you a couple of pictures. Danny, do you see that, that, that brown line? That's the wall that Nehemiah rebuilt. All of that around it is what Jerusalem is today. But that brown wall, that's what they built in 52 days. Next one. There it is broken down. And each one of those lines indicates a section that somebody else was responsible for. They did that in 52 days. And the next one. That's what they accomplished. In 52 days. The walls need to be rebuilt and they need to be defended. And we are called to this town, but to this state and to this country. God is looking for someone to stand in the gap and defend. The city's walls are in ruins. Who will grab a shovel? Who will grab a spear? Who will stand in the gap and fight for this city? Let's pray. Father, this morning, we need the power of God. Because we cannot do this on our own. But God, you do not call us to accomplish things that we can accomplish on our own. You call us to accomplish the impossible so that we will rely on the impossible God to do the impossible in our midst. You never call us to do these things alone. But you say, through Christ, we can accomplish anything. So God, I pray today for your power. I pray, God, for the staying power that when the enemy says, oh, just quit, we fight harder. When the enemy says, oh, just give in, we dig our heels in and say no. When the enemy says, but it'll feel good, we say, go back to where Jesus sends you. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for this city. There are holes in the walls. But God, you have placed Clint outside the city as a gatekeeper. You have placed Gordy inside the city as a gatekeeper. You have placed the Morgans outside the city as gatekeepers. You have placed Vi outside the city as a gatekeeper. You have placed us where we are called to be for a reason. We are to fill a gap. And so right now, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for spiritual discernment that we would begin to see the section of wall that has fallen down around us that we are responsible for. And that we would take on the burden and the responsibility to pray and build that wall back up again in Jesus' name. Father, I pray right now for those that are in a wilderness setting. Jesus knew that. He was there too. But Jesus went through that wilderness for the Lord to destroy the works of the devil and he will do it in your life too. Hold on. Keep walking. What do you do when you feel like you're going through hell? Don't stop. Keep walking until you get out of it and back into the blessing of God. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for all of this, that your kingdom would be established, that your kingdom would come, and that we would seek the good of this city as we are commanded to in Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been a good week. May God bless you. May he equip you and strengthen you. May he fortify you and build you up. May he set a fire in you and blow on it so that it becomes a furnace. By the way,
I had somebody ask me a while back why we have bilingual songs and why we're putting on a Spanish song every now and then. Let me ask you something. How many of you want your kids to do better than you did? How many of you rejoice when your kids or your grandkids achieve, when they do well, when they, when they rise up and win an award or something like that? You see, worship is not always about us. I have my song preferences. They don't always get put up. If there is a song that goes up that you can't sing along to or you don't know or you don't know the words to, Look around. See if somebody else is being touched. Because we are called to rejoice with those who rejoice. And the song that you may not understand is touching somebody else's heart. The song that isn't your style is touching somebody else. We worship together. We don't worship alone. Go out. Encourage one another in the name of the Lord. God bless you.